We are a information service company. We provide high quality information. You also need to value your instinct because at the end of the day, this is the company you lead and the company will model around who you are. So finding that balance that is very elusive. Uh, uh, the geopolitical risks, the policy risks, the long-term growth pros prospect risk, and that's the factual part. But also, we find that actually most of the problems come from out-of-context understanding of what China is. How will you describe what you are doing? What's your company? What right. your company is doing? Right. So we are a information service company. We provide high quality information, mostly data driven information to mostly institutional clients, including investors, including corporates, both domestic and international. We collect data and we package, we productize, we commercialize all these vast trove of data into uh, intelligible uh, knowledge and insights for our clients. Can you tell us more about your how many people in your company? I think you, you have your, actually we talked in your office in Shanghai, now mm -hmm. we are in Beijing. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about the general situation of your company? Yeah, so we have about 70 people. Um, we are spread around uh, Shanghai, Beijing, and a second tier city called Changsha. Um, and we have over a hundred clients, um, as I said, both investors and corporates about 50, 50, um, and also in terms of, you know, China client, China based onshore clients and offshore international clients is also about 50, 50. So that's the landscape. Yeah. And you are the CEO of the company. What's the toughest part of being a CEO? Uh -huh. The thing is, a lot of your decisions, a lot of what you're saying and what you're doing is not about yourself anymore. Um, it has, it, everyone will look to you. Um, every word you are saying will have implication that may go beyond your original intentions. So that's something that's uh, really tough um, because it's, it's not really hum a human thing to think about all those things and you know, sometimes you just want to be um, impulsive. Sometimes you want to go with your instinct, but your instinct might be wrong. But on the other hand, you also need to value your instinct because at the end of the day, this is the company you lead and the company will model around who you are. So finding that balance that is very elusive. Um, you have to you know, follow your heart, right? follow your guts, but also you cannot really follow your guts that extremely. So, so where the balance is, I think that's, that's pretty tough. Yeah. And uh, we know that you actually now have a newsletter, well, business segment. Yeah. And uh, you want to do newsletter because in my right. opinion, you are like a more to be business. Yeah, originally, B2B business. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And newsletter is normally regarded, I guess, to see yeah. business, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it can be, Argued, but why? Why? By why? The, yeah. Right. I think it's a it's a sign of the, the the time. What I mean is, we used to just serve exclusively institutional clients, and all our people we are good at doing that. You know, our salespeople they are you know B two B sales. Our product managers they are not product managers in the traditional consumer company sense, but in the business product SaaS product sense, right? So it's all around that, and it used to be quite good. But, you know, last two years, I think uh, the market is really bad. Um, and especially when it comes to capital markets, because a lot of our clients are from the capital market side. Many of them are being conservative and kind of retreating from the market. And why they are doing that? Because of the general uncertainty about China, um, the geopolitical risks, the policy risks, the long term growth pros prospect risk. And that's the factual part. But also, we find that actually most of the problems come from out of context understanding of what China is. And there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of disinformation. So we cannot be the passive uh, kind of victim of this trend. We want to contribute our part to bridge the gap, to make more people more informed. Um, that's, you know, selfishly, that could help our own business. But I think from a social value perspective, it's also something we find 
uh, meaningful as well. Um, and I and I think that's the original intention. But you know, after we go into this business, it will open us up. We are also receiving a lot of positive feedbacks. One thing is, you know, before when you work with institutions, the response, the feedback cycle can be very long. So, right, you you serve an institutional client, and you maybe have like two or three calls with with them at most a year, and you know it's hard for you to have a quick uh, understanding of where the market is going. Uh, now we are having what thousands of subscribers. A lot of them interact with us on a daily basis. They send us messages. They send us emails. Um, there's way more interaction, and your understanding and our understanding of the market become more granular now, and we feel more connected. So uh, it turns out there are many, also many benefits by choosing this path. Actually, we know that email is a very important tool overseas, right. especially in. America, in yeah. Western countries, yeah. but in China, people can use WeChat. People use lots of different ways to communicate. Right. Email, I think, is not that uh, widely used or that yeah. has not that high level frequency being right. used by the Chinese people. No. And now, more and more people are doing newsletters nowadays. Mm -hmm. What, in your opinion, how do you see that the people in China doing English language based newsletter? What mm -hmm. are their challenges and what are the opportunities? So I think the the main hurdle here, and actually, you know, when I when I know about this business, I was actually shocked to find there was just so few, uh, you know, China-based writers doing that to the global audience. Um, it's just a handful of people, or less than a handful even. And the more I do it, the more I understand is that, you know, it takes certain kind of talent to to achieve this. A talent that can process multiple cultures, multiple narratives at the same time, and who can also converse in different languages. And language, in this sense, is not just like English language, but also all the culture and history and uh, you know understandings behind it, and and describe something of culture A in the in terms of culture B. Actually, realize it's very few talents out here. Not not only not in China, but also in other parts of the world. It's just a very few of them. Um, I think that's the biggest challenge. You know, having those people uh, doing this type of work. Um, I think the second challenge is, um, you know, newsletter or media business in general takes time to build. Uh, it's not something that you can see instant success. So although I think there are still many people who are good at cross-cultural communication, um, without a good team, without good infrastructure, it's also very hard for them to accumulate contents and keep producing contents. Right? It's 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 a very tough thing. It takes years. Overall, it's just going to be very few people who are able to do this. So I think that's a it's a very big challenge. Yeah. There is also one question that I. Kept thinking about is that you know nowadays is people say it's it's a it's a video era of video yeah you know, short videos right people like to see short videos like TikTok do in right. China right right and the I mean the the, the content based on words based on writings mm -hmm. do right. you think it's still going to be I mean useful or people are going to like to read like a yeah kind of you know word based stuff mm -hmm. I I think it's just um, quite obvious that. There will be a collection of different types of media at the same time, and it will have you have different kind of settings. Um, so you know, not only video and text, but also you know, podcasts, audios are actually making a strong um, presence right now, right? Because there are certain settings where people, um, you know, they probably cannot read and cannot. Watch a video. They're maybe cooking. They're driving. They're just before sleep. They want to listen to it, right? And text, texts also have their role,、um, especially in more in-depth discussions, right? You want to, if one you want to write an essay,、um, you know, text is still the lowest cost,、uh, you know, method for you to do that. You can write a video essay, but that's going to be super costly, right? So it's always a matter of use case and cost structure. Um, and I think what's obvious is、um, now people are living 
are going to live in in a stream of contents. Uh, you'll be good surrounded by all the contents, text, videos, audios, games, all the time. You know, nowadays people are not going to be, you know, satisfied with just sit there and do nothing. So they will create opportunities for all kinds of uh, media. Can you tell me one example that your data helps the overseas subscribers or the institutional clients to realize something that they uh, well misunderstood or they didn't have a like a more accurate right. picture about China? Right. Um, well, I think you know we, I can talk about our you know very first post. Uh, that was a post about a Chinese. A uh, coffee brand called Luckin Coffee, which is doing an incredible job, especially after a major accounting fraud two or three years ago, and they kind of rebounded and became now the largest coffee coffee company in China, and even larger than Starbucks China. And our data in that in that article is actually telling a story of, you know, you cannot actually define uh, Luckin as a coffee company. But if you just look at their top selling products, they are actually a, a beverage company with you know, very strong presence of some innovative products that looks almost like a milk tea product, not a coffee product. So it's, coffee is really only part of it, but it's not that obvious. So it's like more diversified, localized, uh, general beverage company. And that's, that's convincing just from looking at the data. And we know of many readers, subscribers share that article um, and find it really interesting. It really it's not something they can easily know if you just look at, say, the stock price of Locking or the, you know the financial statements of Locking. Yeah. And why do you recruit Amber? What is her role? Well, in your company and in your expectation. We want to find people who have the same passion. First of all, with us. Um, and also who are self-driven, who can you know, make up their own plans, know about the things that they want to achieve. Someone who is um, versatile. So actually, you know, when Amber first came, she was a, a what we call a data product analyst. So it's more like a data analysis type of job. She also spent some time working on our, uh, our, our dashboard, SaaS ter terminal product. So as a product manager, so it's more like a kind of internet company product manager role, right? And now she uh, transitioned into a main editor for the newsletter product. So um, for, for all these positions, she has done an incredible job because we're dealing with massive amount of data. And with that, it's actually massive amount of uncertainty. So we are always swimming across uncertainties. And so it, it really, it takes certain kind of skill set to, uh, you know, despite all these uncertainty, uh, can arrive at the most important fact uh, quickly. And uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is we also demand um, speed, um, you know, fast, what we call fast iteration. Um, a lot of our findings, right, they, they have a, expiration date basically you know some trend coming up if you're not quick enough the trend will go away so it takes a you know you have to be scrappy you have to work really quickly um, and that's something Amber is good very good at a lot of the newsletter articles for example are produced really fast um, she can just like quickly pull together data information all kind of materials and create something that is you know quite complete and quite ready to be published. So that's, I think, that's, that's definitely uh, what I value. Actually, in our company, we like to identify a good leader and we like to promote um, these good leaders. And in most cases, those leaders they actually they step up themselves. I don't, I don't actually appoint. Uh, most of them, they just come up and say, okay, so this is what I think about this team. They have some problem and I want to fix it. So our culture creates an environment where people like that have the opportunity to step up. Um, so I think that's same with Amber as well. Uh, if Amber doesn't want to do it, I cannot force it. And it's all you know, under the premise that this is what she wants to do. Um, I wouldn't say she has the perfect capability for, for, for do, to doing that, 
But at the end of the day, no, nobody has any you know, perfect skill set for anything. Um, you always learn on the job. And I think Amber is very good at that. Amber is good at learning on the job. Uh, you know, the ability to learn, the ability to iterate, to evolve is more important than the actual skill. Uh, during my lunch with Amber, I asked her about is this job what he wants to do? Mm -hmm. he, he, she said she, yes. And yeah. uh, what about, uh, I'm going to ask the same question. Yeah. Is this job, is the CEO type of job in the data driven company, what you want to do? Yeah. And if, if you don't do this, what, what are you going to do? Right. The, I think the question, to be honest, is a bit complicated for me. The, the industry, the business we are doing, we're working on, is definitely what I want to do. And there's no other place I want to go. The general information services, helping all types of clients to get good information, to base their decisions on good information, no matter your institutions or individuals, um, and to have a better sense of the world, that's something I definitely want to do. What I'm not really sure is, you know, I actually did not start this company. I, I was, I, I step up also as a CEO of the company during a moment of crisis. Um, and I, before that, I never imagined myself to be a, a kind of CEO role in any company. Um, so I never prepared myself for this. Um, so you can say it's an accidental CEO. Uh, so my feeling about that, to be frank, is complicated. Um, I still have doubts about myself, but although I have to, to, to hide that part. Um, so far, so good. But am I the right person for the job? I think only the results can tell. I cannot say for this moment. And if you don't do this job, what are you going to do? I mean, well, I'm, I'm, I will still be in this business. Mm -hmm. I can still write. I can still let people mm -hmm. to reach better understanding, mm -hmm. right? I, I, can, I, can, I can do a similar job as you do, right? Just, you know, uh, creating good contents for people to, to, to help people better informed. I think that's that's very meaningful. That's that part is meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. Right now, the only difference is I'm leading a team to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. um, originally, I was only thinking about you know doing it. Mm -hmm. I didn't really think about which ex ex exact role I was mm -hmm. taking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean we have known each other for years, but I just want to well let more audience know about you and uh, you know your you you first go, went to USA and to, mm -hmm. to study in a liberal arts type of college. Yeah. Then you transferred from US, United States to Hong Kong. Right. And now and you have been worked in Hong Kong for for, for many years. Yeah. Then now you're back in the main in the Chinese mainland. Right. Uh, how does your previous experience, especially your well your experience in the US and in Hong Kong, shape the well, the working style, your idea, your philosophy about work, about life, about your, yeah. your career here? Yeah, I think many of our job takes a lot of cross-cultural understanding. And I think that's what my experience bring me. And just, it, it trained myself to be, I would say more empathetic, to um, realize that you, there's not really one single way to think about something. Um, I think I intentionally and unintentionally brought myself through this and and you know looking back it's really helping me to to work on this type of business now and it's not the end of the process I still welcome more opportunities to go beyond what I already know and to understand more perspectives